She was the largest ship ever built. And yet her maiden voyage would be her last. After RMS Titanic struck an iceberg, 1,500 men, women, and children drowned, sending shockwaves around the globe and starting a debate that still rages today. Why did she steam at full speed into an ice field? And why did a supposedly unsinkable ship sink so suddenly? Now, a treasure trove of long-lost photographs has been unearthed. This is the Titanic equivalent of King Tutankhamun's tomb. New evidence of an overlooked incident afflicting the super ship. Look at this anomaly in the hull. Wow, this is completely new. A crisis unfolding below decks, even as the Titanic sets sail. A crisis that would drive the ship to disaster. They gambled. Yes. After a century of speculation... It's amazing. ...the true story behind the sinking of the Titanic can now be told. When the RMS Titanic was completed in 1912, She wasn't just the biggest ship afloat. She was the largest man-made object on Earth. Over 880 feet long and 100 feet tall, she could carry 3,500 people. On the spacious upper decks, mahogany-lined rooms awaited those traveling first class. Crowding onto the lower decks, third-class passengers dreamed of a new life in America. Titanic was the wonder of her world. This is the footprint of those mighty vessels. The length of four city blocks, you see it here. And when you look around this dock, you still can imagine that the water line was the height of this dock. Forged here in the docks of Belfast as an invincible symbol of British industry, Titanic became, instead, the byword for catastrophe. And it's extraordinary even now, a century later, to think that something this big, this massive, could sink in the middle of the North Atlantic. Journalist Senan Maloney has spent 30 years researching the disaster. He believes the real story of why it sank is still to be told. There are aspects of this amazing saga that have never been adequately explained. Why was she going so fast when she had been warned repeatedly about an ice field in her path? Why did she not slow down? Why did she not divert? Wider questions about why she was an unsinkable ship that managed to sink in a few hours. For two hours after the collision, the Titanic looked like she'd stay afloat well into the next day. But then, suddenly and inexplicably, the ship plunged beneath the waves. Something catastrophic happened. But what? The answer was surely lost with the ship. Or so everybody thought. Now, an album of photographs that lay undiscovered in an attic for over a hundred years has come to light. An album that charts the Titanic's brief life. This remarkable collection of images shown here for the first time on television, were taken by the Titanic's chief electrical engineer, John Kempster. And using a brand new graphic process, the 2D images of the Titanic 
can now be brought to full color, three-dimensional life. detail is exquisite. The album was found at an auction house by Senon's longtime collaborator and fellow Titanic expert, Steve Raphael. I mean, it's fantastic. I mean, this is the Titanic equivalent of King Tutankhamun's tomb, isn't it? Then your large pictures, of course, are absolutely one of the jewels of the entire collection. The photographs capture the moment the Titanic was launched into the water in a stunning sequence of images. And I love it that he puts an annotation on each photograph, going, going, gone. Using the living stills technique, we can see the launch as it happened at the time. But these photographs aren't just a unique window onto an historic moment. There's something else. I, I kept turning the pages, and I wasn't really quite prepared for what I was about to see, because as I turned to this section, I spotted what I thought was a very strange mark on Titanic's hull, and it's just there. Wow. Uh, it struck me as being very odd. I thought possibly it could be a, a reflection from the water, but on looking at the photograph in more detail, I realized it couldn't be, because the next photograph following on from there shows the same diagonal black mark, but the ship is at a different angle. She's moved. This is a crucial thing. In the two photographs, the camera angle and position has changed significantly. But the mysterious mark, over 30 feet long, doesn't change position. And if you blow the image up even more, and particularly that area, you will see that the top part of that black diagonal mark follows the line of the hull plating. Yeah. Which is very, very strange. And it just stops there, doesn't it? It just stops completely. Exactly. What you found is absolutely inexplicable. We were looking at the exact area where the iceberg struck, and we appeared to have a weakness or damage to the hull in that specific place before she even left Belfast. If the Titanic had been weakened in the very region where it would be struck by an iceberg, it could rewrite history. But what could lie behind the mark? The photographs reminded Senon of a fact known generally only to Titanic historians. The ship suffered a fire. It instantaneously jumped into my mind that we had a fire in this location before she even left Belfast. The fire took hold in a coal bunker in Boiler Room 6, and the room is directly behind the place where the dark mark begins. The question is, once he knew he was approaching Iceland. The fire was mentioned in the official inquiry in 1912, but was judged to have played no role in the disaster. So I've always known about the fire, uh, and yet people tend to treat it as an irrelevancy. I've seen 
other researchers who tend to discard it because this fire was played down. This new evidence sent Senan back to eyewitness accounts given by people on board. One description in particular, reported just days after the disaster in a New York newspaper, caught his eye. I found an article by John Dilly, a fireman, who wasn't brought before the bench in London. He actually was speaking at the quayside to a journalist, and he said that, unlike uh, an irrelevancy, the Titanic fire was very, very important. John Dilly was one of a team of firemen and stokers who kept the hungry Titanic boilers fed with coal. Dilly describes a serious fire in one of the ship's huge coal storage bunkers. It was discovered the day the Titanic prepared to leave Belfast for Southampton and begin her maiden voyage. The procedure for coal bunker fires was to dig out the burning coal before the fire spread. But the Titanic was the biggest ship ever built. Her coal bunkers were three stories high. He said, my sole duty, together with 11 other men, that's how many fought the fire. It's incredible. If you couldn't have uh, an easily extinguished fire, that spoke to me of a very major fire. And this is what Dilly is saying. Listen to him. He says, there were hundreds of tons of coal stored there. We made no headway against it. Four days later, and the fire was getting worse. But still, here is Dilly making serious claims about this fire. We didn't get that fire out. From the day we sailed, the Titanic was on fire. On the 10th of April, 1912, the Titanic set sail from Southampton. The upper decks housed dozens of millionaires, including Benjamin Guggenheim and Lady Astor. The lower decks held over 2,000 passengers. Yet no one was told about the fire raging below. The men were under strict orders to keep quiet. Of course, sir. The passengers knew nothing of the fire. The officers told us to keep, keep our, our mouths mouth shut. Keep your mouth shut. The mark in the newly discovered photographs has led Senan to suspect that the fire below decks played a much more important role in the Titanic disaster than anyone had ever realized. Rare photographs of the doomed supership Titanic have revealed a mysterious mark 30 feet long on the ship's hull. They've sparked a new investigation into the sinking. At her launch, Titanic made headlines around the world. She took nearly two and a half thousand expectant passengers on her maiden voyage. Now, Senan Maloney has discovered that even as the ship set sail, the men below decks were fighting a fierce coal bunker fire. But was the fire serious enough to have played a part in the ship's sinking? That's what draws me into this story. I can't believe that a fire would have done so much warping and distortion to have done this seeming damage. How are you doing? Uh, how are you? Thanks so much for meeting me. Look at this. Is that the location of, of a coal bunker? Yeah, that's going into a coal bunker. Amazing. Dr. Guillermo Rain is one of only a handful of scientists specializing in the dynamics of coal fires. 
This could definitely be because of a smaller fire. Dr. Rain thinks it's likely that the coal fire started by itself and burned for some time before it was detected. The scary part of the smoldering coal is that it doesn't need an ignition event. It's spontaneous, it's what we call self-heating. It doesn't need an arsonist, it doesn't even need an accident. Just the bed of coal, the kernel of the bed will start to very slowly to heat up, but it will continue spreading until actually over the course of weeks. Might the weeks? Yeah. So when someone detects a smoldering fire in a big bed of coal, the fire has been going on for days for sure, weeks probably. The fire was discovered the day the Titanic set sail from Belfast. But the coal had been loaded into its bunkers three weeks earlier. I have accounts from people who went on board at Belfast and who saw a smoldering coal fire in the coal bunker there. Does that mean it must necessarily have been there for weeks already? Yeah. Really? The difficulty is that by the time you get a smell or, or signs that there is a fire happening in your bunker, it's already too late. And it's really difficult to suppress a smoldering fire. Very difficult. Why? Because what, what heat are we talking about down there? Smoldering fuels have a range of peak temperatures, maximum temperatures, that go from 500 Celsius to maybe 1,000 Celsius. 1,000 Celsius? Yes. The coal was stacked directly against the hull and a watertight internal division called a bulkhead. Both were critical to the ship's strength. Exposing them to the extreme temperatures of a coal fire would have been incredibly dangerous. The worst case scenario is that it starts to affect severely the mechanical properties of the structure. It's a design flaw. It is a design flaw. Let's put it this way, I would not go into a ship that I know there is a small a smoldering fire inside. Really? No. Guillermo was telling me incredible things, that it was blazing for weeks before anyone even noticed, long before the ship even set sail from Belfast. Back in 1912, the scale of the blaze seems to have spooked the firemen who travelled with the ship to Southampton. Only eight of the original crew of 160 took the onward journey to America. It was an unprecedented change of crew. So why would Titanic's owners go ahead and send their brand new flagship to sea with a major fire below decks? Could the answer lie in the troubled origins of the Olympic-class liners? On the surface, they were a prestige project. Fifty percent bigger than any other ship afloat. They were so large that new docks had to be built just to moor the Titanic and her sister ship, the Olympic. She is uh, billed in some quarters as queen of the ocean and a, a spectacular career is envisaged for her. She is literally a wonder of the world. But in reality, owners White Star were losing business to rivals Cunard. White Star's chairman, J. Bruce Ismay, was under pressure to turn the company around. The new super ships were his master plan to win the transatlantic shipping wars. J. Bruce Ismay was a high-born individual who brooks uh, no interference with his will. When he has something in his mind, it must be done just so. Sennon has come to meet author Brad Matson, an expert on the Titanic's construction. I didn't look too deeply into the coal bunker fire because most people were dismissing it. Now that I hear that there may be some new evidence, I am very interested in looking into it. Wow. I've never seen these photographs. No, this is completely new. Brad sheds light on the owner's decision to set sail with a dangerous fire below decks. 
the commercial urgency that was driving the White Star Line was driving them to cut certain corners that they didn't necessarily have to cut in order to get these ships to sea right away. Constructors Harland and Wolf designed the Titanic here at their drafting room in Belfast. On several occasions, J. Bruce Ismay responded to budgetary pressures by amending their plans. There were reductions uh, in the scantlings and the dimensions of the steel, uh, the number of lifeboats, and a number of other aspects in the construction of the ship. The effects of cost-cutting on the new vessels were evident when the Titanic sister ship, the Olympic, collided with the Royal Navy's HMS Hawk. The photographs show the huge hole punched in her hull. The images appear to reveal that the steel used on the Olympic-class ships was substandard, a view confirmed by metallurgist Dr. Martin Strangwood. There was a lot of cracking in the steel, which is not a good idea. The bow of the Hawk can actually penetrate in through the hull steel, and if uh, as an engineer of that time, you were looking at pictures like this. It's showing that the steel has a capability to fail in an impact. Intriguingly, Dr. Strangwood also says this grade of steel doesn't cope well with extreme heat. The steel should be resistant to the effects of a fire as much as possible. So you'd want the cleanest steel possible. And during the making of this documentary, Senan Maloney unearthed an extraordinary letter that suggests there were concerns about the steel at the time. I found references to the Board of Trade and a high-ranking official. He's asking that the Titanic should be using what's called a special quality of steel. Uh, in response to that, we get a you know pretty testy letter from Harland and Wolf that steel to ordinary requirements and tests was used throughout the vessel. Mm. Ordinary steel, not special steel. This idea of a super ship is beginning to fall apart. Isn't well, it? you know, that's phenomenal, really. The damage to the Olympic put it out of action for eight weeks. And the repair affected the Titanic's schedule, too. This photograph shows the sheer scale of the Titanic's prop shaft and her propeller. Both had to be transferred to repair the Olympic in a bid to get her back out to sea as quickly as possible. It delayed delivery of the Titanic by a month and her maiden voyage had to be postponed several times. Now the fire threatened one delay too many. Imagine what the newspapers would have done with something like that. White Star ship fails to sail on time. How, did, how would that look? Mm. Who's, buy, who's buying the next set of tickets, right? I think their finances were so fragile, it could have brought White Star down. Meanwhile, we have this fire that's roaring away, and nobody has attended to it. But this was madness, sending a ship with a fire I like this absolutely. to sea. How many people would have gotten off if you'd have said, well, folks, there's a fire burning down below. I think I might have gotten off that ship. They're making dangerous decisions that everything is going to be all right and they're going to sail come what may. This ship is sailing no matter what. That's right. The Titanic pushed ahead on schedule. She made a brief stop at Queenstown in Ireland before steaming west towards America. The passengers were still completely unaware that beneath their feet, the fire was now so intense, it was endangering the ship's steel structure.
As the Titanic headed off on its maiden voyage, passengers promenaded on the luxuriously wide upper decks, settling in for a six-day journey to New York. They were totally unaware that in the bowels of the ship, a fire was raging. Men were battling to extinguish a blaze in a three-story high coal bunker. Despite the fire, the captain had steamed into open ocean. It was a decision that would have tragic consequences. In the aftermath of the sinking, the British government were pressured into setting up an inquiry. It was held in the Scottish Drill Hall in London. Oh my God. Holy, wow. I've seen many, many pictures of it, but the photographs don't even come close to doing it justice. This is a shrine to what happened and all the evidence that was yeah. given. It's amazing. The inquiry was overseen by Commissioner Lord Mersey, and more than a hundred people were called to give evidence. Most were top brass from the shipping company. For 11 days, the coal bunker fire was barely mentioned. But then, after being denied two times, Thomas Lewis, the leader of the Firemen's Union, won the right to question his men. We finally get some firemen into the witness box and Tommy Lewis starts driving towards right. the fire. The first to be questioned was one of the replacement crew who boarded at Southampton, Charles Hendrickson. They ask Hendrickson, when did you start getting the coal out? First watch we did from Southampton, we started to get it out. They only began tackling the fire after the ship sailed. Bunker 10 held more than 100 tonnes of coal, only accessible via two hatches. The only way to deal with the fire was to shovel the burning coal into the engine furnaces. So they were moving the coal job. around while it was on fire into the, the boilers. Furnaces, yeah. yeah. Three days into the voyage, Hendrickson and his team are still shoveling the burning coal. It took us right up to the Saturday to get it out. But once the coal was out, Hendrickson discovered evidence of the extreme temperature generated inside the bunker. The bulkhead forms part of the bunker, the side. Yes, you could see where the bulkhead had been red hot. Red hot, yeah, this is incredible. This is one of the, of the ship's major protections. Right. And it's burning red hot. That seems to me like a very big deal indeed. The steel wall that had taken the brunt of the fire was one of the Titanic's main bulkheads. The bulkheads divided the hull into separate watertight compartments. In the event of a breach in the hull, they stopped water flooding the entire ship. The firemen at the inquiry revealed that the bulkhead had been severely damaged by the fire. And he says, it was dented. The bottom of the watertight compartment was warped. This is so dented. important. This is a crucial area to defend the ship yeah. against the ocean coming in. That's amazing. A warped bulkhead should have raised serious concerns. But incredibly, the damage was just covered over. 
And Hendrickson says, I just brushed it off and got some black oil and rubbed over it to give it its ordinary appearance. What in tarnation was going on with the control of the ship, the senior officers? Despite these revelations, throughout the inquiry, Lord Mersey seemed uninterested in the fire and eager to move on. Commissioner Lord Mersey doesn't want to know. Right. He was making repeated interruptions and right. closing it down whenever they tried to develop the fire story to see where it went. Do let us confine ourselves to the real serious issues of this inquiry. That fire in the bunker has nothing to do with it. This is a phenomenal piece of information and Mercy doesn't want to hear any of it. The Titanic was now just under three days from New York. This was one of the Titanic's first class lounges. Only the wealthiest passengers on board enjoyed these luxurious salon suites. But as guests relaxed, on the bridge, Captain Edward Smith and White Star Chairman Bruce Ismay were receiving wireless warnings that icebergs were drifting into the ship's path. And although the burning coal in Bunker 6 had now been cleared, astonishing new evidence reveals that the red-hot bulkhead had caused the fire to spread. I've come across an article in the New York Tribune from Saturday, April the 20th, 1912. The story was first told by an officer. He's saying the fire was in the coal bunkers, plural. Coal bunkers, not one. And this is giving accurate information. He says it was in Stokeholds 9 and 10. Here we have evidence of spread into not one bunker, but two. Firemen were now frantically clearing out a second bunker, throwing even more coal into the furnaces. Could this new information explain one of the greatest mysteries of the Titanic disaster? Inexplicably, despite the warnings, the Titanic maintained course and accelerated to top speed into the ice field. The Titanic wasn't trying to set a record time for a transatlantic crossing. She simply wasn't fast enough. So why did she hit top speed? A second fire, causing tons more burning coal to be emptied into her furnaces, could finally explain the mystery. That huge amount of coal being transferred into the, the hungry furnaces faster than they would like. This is the impelling driving force that is feeding into a ship. She's now at 22 and a half knots, charging towards her destiny. Richard de Kerbrick, a world authority on coal-powered ships, is surprised by the second fire. The fact that they were emptying these, these bunkers, fighting two bunkers, could that have played its own, its own role? Yes, indeed. And this is a relevant thing which has affected the performance of the ship. But why wouldn't the captain slow the ship to a safe speed as she approached the ice? One factor may have been overlooked. The country was in the middle of a miners' strike, and the Titanic had taken on just enough fuel to make it to New York. The fires had already burned through her stock. Would losing momentum now waste more of her dwindling supply? Well, if she was to slow down, then when to pile on the speed again, that would increase your coal consumption. If it's a premium, um, we're going to run, run short. The Titanic didn't have the coal reserves left to do anything more than maintain speed and stick to her course. 
So the combination of all these events and scenarios had backed them into a corner. Does that all make sense? That does make sense. It uh, seems to be a logical sequence. When you first put it to me about this fire, I hadn't put too much stock on it. But seeing the evidence you've placed before me, I think you've lit another fire under this investigation. When Jay Bruce Ismay and Captain Smith read the ice warnings, the possibility of hitting an iceberg seemed unlikely. While the danger of running out of fuel in the middle of the Atlantic was very real. Just consider, she's on a maiden voyage, carrying a gaggle full of millionaires on board who've got arrangements and shares to look at when they get to New York. They weren't to foresee the strike of the iceberg, but they could foresee not arriving in New York because they ran out of coal. And that would be damage to prestige and the PR for a white start. Against the higher risk of uh, embarrassment, they chose to go with the lower risk of catastrophe, and they gambled. You could say that, yes. The gamble backfired. At 11.40 p.m., the Titanic collided with an iceberg. But it wasn't the ice alone that claimed the ship. In the last hours, the fire had one final deadly role to play in the disaster. A mysterious dark mark on the Titanic's hull has opened up an important new chapter in the story of the ship's sinking. Senan Maloney believes a serious coal fire below decks accelerated the ship directly into an ice field. At 11.40 p.m. on the 14th of April, 1912, 400 miles off the coast of Newfoundland, the Titanic struck an iceberg. The collision punctured the forward starboard side of the hull. But the bulkheads held firm, and a rescue vessel was not far away. There was no reason why Titanic couldn't have lasted an hour and a half longer uh, Carpathia would have reached it and no one would have died. The ship's designer clearly agreed. He assessed the damage and said the ship would not sink, but only if critical bulkheads held. What he did not know is that one of the bulkheads in question had been badly damaged. Buried in the transcripts of the American Inquiry, Senan believes he has found the final event that triggered the ship's sudden sinking. So the American Inquiry was brilliant in that initial surge of enthusiasm in drawing out some key answers. Lead fireman Fred Barrett had fought the coal bunker fire and was in boiler room six at the very moment when the ship hit the iceberg. As seawater flooded in, he took refuge behind the very bulkhead warped by the fire. When I turn to the evidence of Fred Barrett, I'm further reinforced in my idea that something serious is happening here, and at a very crucial period. Around two hours after the collision, Barrett says something drastically changed. He describes a torrent of water crashing through the fire-damaged bulkhead. I saw a wave of green foam come tearing through between the boilers. This breach sealed the ship's fate. When that wall of steel goes, we have a series of tipping dominoes. And this is the critical failure that suddenly gives the upper hand to the ocean. An academic study has shown that at this precise moment, 
the ship started to sink rapidly. Within 30 minutes, the chronometer on the bridge was beneath the waves. Fireman Barrett's evidence directly links the failure of the damaged bulkhead to the ship's final fate. But was it the fire that caused it to give way? That's where we have to go, and I need to find out whether the fire could have played a much more crucial part than we were ever taught before in the Titanic story. Working together, Dr. Guillermo Rain and metallurgist Dr. Martin Strangwood have estimated the damage the fires would have had on the ship's steel structures. Their conclusions are significant. Good to see you. How are you? Meet Martin. Hi there. Next Hi, we have conducted experiments um, in my lab at Imperial. So what the bulkhead does is the hot part bulges. It's a significant bulge out. Very okay? noticeable. The blue Sorry. is that actually it bulges inwards. So it doesn't bulge all of it out. There is a part of it that bulges in. So, so you get a, a buckling of the, the plate. You, you have like a wave across the bulkhead. This is the first time scientific analysis has been used to predict the extent of the damage caused by the fire. And it matches the eyewitness accounts from the Titanic firemen to a remarkable degree. That is absolutely amazing, gentlemen, because that will tell you what was, what was said in 1912, in this exact section we're talking about. The bottom of the watertight bulkhead was dinged aft and the other part was dinged forward. This, this is what you see here. Mm. It's amazing, isn't right. it? That's precisely what we are predicting. According to the computer model, this type of warping only happens at very high temperatures. It confirms historic reports of the damage and that the fire was far more significant than the inquiry suggested. The effect of the heat on the bulkhead steel would have been catastrophic. The strength will change. How much it can resist cracking will change. It's going to be you know, a quarter of the strength that it has at room temperature. Of strength, right? Which is why it deforms so much. So if you have a gradual buildup of water, the force on the steel mm -hmm. is high enough to cause a crack. And then the brittleness of the steel means that crack spreads right across in a very catastrophic manner. Wow, it went through. This is amazing. This modern analysis underpins the story told by the Titanic firemen. From the day we sailed, the Titanic was on fire. The coal bunker fire fatally weakened the steel to a quarter of its original strength. You could see where the bulkhead had been red hot. Eventually, the water pressure took its toll, and the brittle bulkhead gave way. I saw a wave of green foam come tearing through between the boilers. I find this new theory that has been put together entirely credible, and I'm impressed. This now, to my mind, revolutionizes our understanding of how the Titanic sank. The failure of the fire-damaged bulkhead is central to the huge loss of life on the Titanic. The bulkheads were the sole reason the Titanic carried so few lifeboats. If they'd held, the ship would have stayed afloat long enough for everyone to be ferried to a rescue vessel. Instead, 1,500 men, women and children plunged to their deaths in the icy Atlantic water. The most shocking aspect of this investigation is that all this evidence was available to the inquiry in 1912. So why has it taken so long to come to light? Sennan believes it's because the ship's owners hid the truth. I don't blame the firemen or the trimmers. They were doing what they were told. There's a culture of cover-up within the White Star Line. As soon as he was on the rescue ship, 
Chairman J. Bruce Ismay sent telegrams ahead to White Star HQ in New York. Sennon believes he was already making plans to stop the truth getting out. Ismay has just survived the most traumatic event of his life. And what is his first concern? It's to send telegrams in a code word. His name backwards from Ismay to Yamsi. And I quote, think most unwise keep Titanic crew until Saturday. Most undesirable have crew New York so long. He wants the firemen brought back to England as quickly as possible. He wants them out of there. He wants them to keep quiet. White Star told the American inquiry that no firemen had survived. Yet fireman Fred Barrett was still working in their service. At the British inquiry, Lord Mersey, a patron of the Shipbuilders Guild, didn't call 57 surviving firemen and brushed over the evidence of those who did appear. Mersey concluded that the disaster was an unavoidable accident caused by excessive speed and made no mention of the fire. It's taken 105 years and Senon's investigation finally to reveal the full story. These anomalies has given us the truth and that the story of the RMS Titanic really is one of fire and ice. Well, tomorrow night at 8, Channel 4 Dispatches asks President Trump, how scared should we be? On the way next tonight, it was the royal affair that shook the nation. But who was listening to their calls? The first of a two-parter, spying on the royals.